Well, I'm delighted to be here. And I love that in my introduction and the resume they printed of me, they call me a humanitarian. It sounds awfully grand. I, last week, I happened to be in Martha's Vineyard. I, I'd never been there before. A friend invited me. And she took me while I was there to Oak Bluffs, a small town. And there they have the oldest carousel in America. And it's a catch the brass ring carousel. I'd often heard of this phrase, and, but I had absolutely no idea. I knew it was associated with carousels, but I couldn't figure out how it went together. And I can't tell you, you know, in, in literature often you hear people talking about catching the brass ring as a metaphor for going for something, reaching for something. And I, I was so thrilled. Of course, I rode the thing, and I was... <laughs> It was just wonderful, and I went on and on and on about it so much to my friend that I finally understood this piece of Americana that when I left, uh, she gave me this wonderful little bracelet with a brass ring that says, Catch the Brass Ring, which is a great segue into my talk this morning. I wanted to reflect, actually, on taking risks, a reflection inspired by the Greek author Nikos Kazantzakos. He said, to always choose the sure thing is treason for the soul. In other words, what to choose always what we know to be comfortable and sure and safe does not stretch us. There's no risk involved, no adventure, no growth. And I can testify that when I have yet again chosen what I know to be sure and comfortable, either out of fear of the unknown or to avoid upsetting others, I somehow feel slightly diminished. We're constantly, all day long, being uh, presented with choices. Shall I go left? Shall I go right? Shall I wear the red? Shall I wear the green? But some choices involve us taking a risk grasping for that uh, brass ring. In the 70s, I was training to be a modern ballet dancer. And I wanted to turn professional. But I was doing temporary secretarial work on the side to support myself. And one day, my agency sent me to Sotheby's, the art auction house, to type labels for the day. As soon as I crossed that threshold, I knew I wanted to be in the art auction business. It was so thrilling. And, right, and they found out I could do Pittman shorthand. I don't know if any of you know. It was all like doing advanced algebra in those days. And they offered me a permanent job. And I grasped that brass ring. I said goodbye to my dancing aspirations. The world is probably very happy about it. But I... Um, <laughs> And I entered the art auction business. I became an expert cataloger in Japanese art. And putting a sale together required a tremendous amount of work. But then when it came time to hand it to, to, for the actual auction, I had to hand it over to an auctioneer who didn't necessarily know a thing about the items being sold or the potential bidders. I became increasingly upset because it felt like I was giving my child away, I, I, uh, th that I wasn't able to complete the process. And I decided that no matter what the risk, I was going to ask if I could be an auctioneer. Now, by this time, Sotheby's was 230 years old. It was founded in London in 1744. George Washington was 12, and never had a woman stepped into the rostrum. So I knew, I had no delusions. I knew it was an impossible request. Nevertheless, I called and made an appointment with the president of, to see the president of the company. I worked on my speech for ages. And of course, he was going to say, no, don't be so ridiculous. So I crafted a, a response that was full of reasons I thought he might like to reconsider. The morning of my meeting, my colleagues, who thought me quite mad uh, and were, but were amused at my audacity, stood around and they shed mock tears on my behalf. As I went off, they fully expected me to return toot to sweet with my head in my hands. 
Well, full of trepidation, I knocked on the president's door. I went in, sat down, and launched into my pitch. And much to my astonishment, when I finished, he tipped back in his chair and he said, you know, I think that's a great idea. Let's start your training next week. Well, that grasping for the brass ring, that going for it, stepping out of my comfort zone, propelled my life in a whole new direction. Not only did I become the first woman art auctioneer in America, with the, the news of which, and the picture of myself, was in probably every major newspaper across the land, but I became a top flight auctioneer, and as was said I, a few years ago, <laughs> Uh, on a fun note, I was cast playing myself in the first Sex and the City movie. So it seemed that life was very good, but something wasn't right. And around this same time, I became aware that drinking was a problem. And it is said that the beginning of wisdom is to call something by its correct name. And I called myself by my correct name, and I labeled myself an alcoholic. I reached out for help. Help arrived. And an essential element of recovery from addiction is to pursue a spiritual path. And that spiritual path can be really summed up in helping others. Helping others by telling one's story, what it was like, what happened, what it's like now. So the essential element, it's an essential element to get honest about one's own story. Life got so much sweeter. Then in 1981, a friend gave me a book about Mother Teresa of Calcutta. Now, believe me, I wasn't the slightest bit interested in reading about this do-good little nun in <laughs> India. But the book had large print and lots of pictures, so I thought, all right, I'll read it. And <laughs> by the time I'd finished, I was completely hooked. Here was a woman who was full of joy, whose entire life was devoted to helping others. I decided I wanted to go to Calcutta and see her work. Now, I had a lot of vacation time accrued because I was a bit of a workaholic also, so I booked a round-trip ticket to Calcutta. And I decided I'm just going to show up. Having read the book, I knew Mother Teresa's nuns needed an auctioneer like a hole in the head. <laughs> and if I wrote and announced that I was coming, they'd probably write back and say, listen, Unless you have nursing skills, please don't bother. However, the money you were thinking of spending on your fare, do send that to us. Well, I wasn't going to do that, and I had absolutely no idea what to expect. But something propelled me out of the safety of my New York Sotheby life. And I ended up, you know, cleaning maggots out of flesh, uh, burying the dead ministering in all sorts of ways that were a far cry from selling Picassos and fine silver. But that leaving the perceived safety of my New York Sotheby life turned out to be the first of many trips to India, a very close personal relationship with Mother Teresa, writing a book, and in 2004 being called by the Vatican to testify as a witness for the cause of her beatification. It was a great honor. So, you know, my risk takings have not been of the heroic variety, but I'm always so moved by tales of those who have really risked their reputations, and in some cases, their very lives. This past July 4th, a couple of friends of myself got together and we took turns reading out loud the Declaration of Independence. What a document. Those 56 men could not possibly have foreseen the consequences of their action. But at the time, far better that my ancestors, the British, <laughs> consider them traitors 
than that they commit their souls to treason. One of my particular heroes, that, you know, we all know there's legions of others who have really risked and, and grasped that brass ring and gone all the way, and there's many, many, many. But one of my heroes is Rosa Parks. In 1955 in Montgomery, Alabama, this unknown African-American 42-year-old woman defied the law by refusing to relinquish her seat on the bus to a white passenger. Her defiance in the face of tremendous hostility and physical risk was to galvanize the civil rights movement. And later she said about it, she said that she felt that she'd reached a crossroads. It was an ordinary day, an ordinary bus ride, but it was her crossroads moment. And she felt she just could not give in one more time. Now, in 1989, Mother Teresa suffered a heart attack, and actually, we thought it was the end for her. She thankfully lived another eight years, but anyway, I dashed off to Calcutta, went straight to the hospital, and uh, went into her room. It was a very, very narrow room, and there was Mother propped up in bed, and she was absolutely shocked and delighted to see me, and she held out her arms, and I instantly bowed my head for her blessing, and I was so choked up I could hardly speak, but I held her hands. And there was Sister Monica and Sister Shanti in this very narrow room, so there were just the four of us. Very shortly after I had got there, a young priest arrived to say Mass. The patient's table was set up at the foot of the bed, and he stood there, it was set up as the altar, he stood there facing Mother. Now, it wasn't lost on me what... Uh, privilege it was to be in this rather rarefied situation, and I was filled with gratitude as we began the Mass. Then it came time for communion, and the priest came round the side of the bed to give the host to Mother. And I groaned inwardly as I watched him dip the host in the chalice of wine and offer it to mother. She leaned forward, took it on her tongue. I was next. Now, mother knew I was a recovering alcoholic, and she was absolutely fascinated because she had success with every form of suffering human, but she could not help the addicted. Why? Because she did not have her own personal story to tell. She could not say, I know how you feel, let me tell you what happened to me. But she was always so interested, and she always wanted to talk to me about my drinking and, and my uh, recovery. So much so, it was usually the topic of our conversation, so much so, that sometimes I'd say to her, Mother, are you sure you don't have a problem? You're, <laughs> you're awfully interested. And she'd laugh. Now I am standing by the bed at a crossroads moment for me in my sobriety. Oh God, not here. Please don't let me have to make a fuss about the wine here. Not with this woman the world considers a saint in her sickbed and possibly dying right next to me. Please don't let me bring all the attention onto myself. Then I remembered where I'd come from and all those who had helped me, and of my unconditional commitment not to take alcohol in any form, no matter how rarefied or precious the circumstances. How many would be doomed if I was not around to tell my story? Now, up until that time, I had certainly been guilty of people-pleasing as far as mother was concerned. She preferred I wear a skirt and a dress, so I didn't wear trousers when I was with her. She, I went to confession with a priest I didn't like, and certainly not out of any religious motivation. I went simply because it pleased her, and I wanted to please her, I wanted to fit in. But this was a line I could not, would not cross. And no matter what the risk, no matter how awkward I felt, no matter how much I disturbed others, I would not do it. 
By this time, this poor young priest is holding the sodden wafer up for me to take on my tongue. And I got very nervous and I stammered, no wine, a little too loudly. And he looked nervous, saying mass for bedridden Mother Teresa. And he was confused. And so I nudged Sister Monica to take it. She took it, and he went to, le to leave, and I said, I would like communion, but please don't dip it in the chalice. Now, by this time, I thoroughly disturbed Mother Teresa's devotions, I, um, but she's watching the whole scene. I'm standing there feeling really awkward, out of it. I don't belong. What am I doing here? Why do I always have to make a fast? Mother's hand came across the covers. She took my hand, she pulled me down to her, and she whispered, don't worry, well done. You must continue to protect your precious gift. And I ask you, have we all not been given a precious gift in some form or the other? And is it not worth everything we have to protect that precious gift? And I love, as those signers of the Declaration said, our sacred honor. And it seems to me that heaven is very respectful of our free will. It never forces itself upon us, but holds its breath, wondering which way we will choose. And I believe Nikos Kazantzakis was right when he said, to always choose the sure thing is treason for the soul. <laughs>